Hello, and welcome to the third lecture in my series on opiate narcotics. Uh, I'm calling this a supplemental lecture uh, partly because it's short and uh, partly because I hadn't originally intended to record it. Uh, I got through my second lecture in the series thinking that it would be the last and thinking that I would move on to talking about marijuana, which I will very soon, and it occurred to me I hadn't really talked at all about treatment for dependence on opiates. And I thought that was important. I mean, we know a fair bit about treatment for dependence on these drugs. And it, I felt like it was a missed opportunity to talk more generally about some basic information about treatment, some of which I've covered in previous lectures, some of which I haven't. So with that in mind, I thought I'd do a little quick supplemental lecture. Hopefully you'll find it interesting. And um, like I said, after that, we'll move on and talk a bit about marijuana in the lecture 12 series. So for today, I want to talk briefly about the biopsychosocial model, um, a, a kind of a term, an idea that you may have encountered before if you've taken psychology classes, but it has some applications here when we talk about drugs. I want to talk a little bit about detoxification for opiates, and then just talk briefly about some of the treatment options. So first off, biopsychosocial model. What is it and how does it apply to uh, drug dependence? Well. You may have heard this phrase before, uh, even if you haven't, you can guess that this is a model or, or a theory or an attempt to represent a behavior or set of behaviors, in this case, uh, drug dependence, using biological, psychological, and social factors. So the biopsychosocial model is this general way of thinking about a lot of behavior, including addiction or dependence, that encourages us to see the different factors which can play a role in that behavior, the biological factors, the psychological factors, and the social factors. So when we think about dependence, we know this is a complicated phenomenon. We want to make sure we take into account as many of the variables as possible. And so we think of this biopsychosocial model. So what are some of these factors or variables that we need to think about? Well, one is, at least under the heading of biological factors, these dopamine pathways that we've talked about way back from the very beginning of the semester. Recall that almost everything that you do, almost all the behavior that you engage in that is in pursuit of some sort of a reward involves activity within this kind of set of pathways in your brain that extend up from the hindbrain a little bit, but especially from the midbrain up into the forebrain and involve uh, different monoamines, particularly dopamine, but also serotonin. You can see that diagrammed here. Now this is relevant when we think about drugs because Almost all the drugs that we've talked about, certainly all the ones which we think of as quite addictive, involve activity within these pathways. So that includes the opiates, but also things like cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, and probably most other drugs as well. Activity in these pathways uh, is associated with a sense of craving or a kind of a subjective wanting of the drug and drug seeking behavior. So if you're someone who is addicted to uh, caffeine or you're addicted to nicotine or you're addicted to opiates, when you're wanting that drug, that is the, the feeling which accompanies activity within the system, activity that's designed to motivate and to guide behavior in pursuit of a goal. And the goal here is drugs. Now, uh, I've mentioned a few times in the past that this system uh, evolved within our brain as, as our brain has evolved um, you know, uh, phylogenetically um, so as to pursue rewards which are uh, healthy and adaptive, things like pursuing food or pursuing opportunities for reproduction or pursuing safety when in times of danger. Um, your brain has this system for a real purpose. The, uh, the, th the thinking or the theory is with drugs, drugs uh, activate the system in a very powerful way, so they tend to hijack the system. And of course, drugs are really not necessary for your survival. So um, it's kind of a, an accident of, of our human history that we have these things in our world, drugs, which powerfully activate these same systems which really evolved um, in the absence of drugs. I mean, there have always been uh, fungi and plants which had uh, psychoactive alkaloids, but powerful concentrated drugs like are now in our environment that have been produced by men and, well, and women too, um, those are, are a novelty in terms of evolutionary history. Our brain really isn't ready to deal with the powerful um, hijacking capability of something like cocaine or, or opium or even nicotine and caffeine. 
I've mentioned briefly before um, that this pathway involves a lot of different um, a lot of different uh, uh, areas within your brain. I want to highlight one of them right now. That is the nucleus accumbens. It's a part of this reward system. And what's interesting about this area of the brain is it has a fairly dense population of a particular group of opioid receptors. Recall that opioids are a class of neurotransmitters which the brain naturally produces to facilitate communication. They are chemically resemblant to the molecules in opiate drugs which people take and that uh, goes a long way to explaining why when you take an opiate drug like heroin or like um, you know, Oxycontin, it produces these same kind of powerful rewarding and pleasing and numbing and narcotic effects, which we sometimes see people naturally get uh, when they uh, achieve a reward or uh, their brain is blocking some of the pain they're experiencing from, from uh, you know, an injury or etc. So part of our reward pathway involves not just dopamine and serotonin, but also uh, opioids um, or uh, endogenous opioids, which uh, are um, are, which activate different receptors. And if you want to, uh, if, if you want to kind of place a, um, a subjective feeling that goes along with the activation of these systems, we might uh, liken it to uh, in the intense pleasure that we get, or the intense satisfaction, maybe is a better word, that we get when we do something uh, that's that's good. You know, when you have a good meal, or you. Um, you, you hug someone you love, or you have sex, or when you escape a dangerous situation, there's a sense of, ah, good, I did something good. You, your, your brain, in a sense, rewards itself for having done a good behavior, which of course can positively reinforce the repetition of that behavior when appropriate. So every time you, know, you have a, a nice meal, you think, oh, that was so satisfying. I, I'm looking forward to having my next good meal, or you, you have sex and you think, oh, that was wonderful, that how satisfying, you kind of are looking forward to doing it again. Similarly, um, although in a more extreme way, if you use drugs which activate the system, perhaps particularly opiates, you have a powerful sense of satisfaction, like that was just great, that, that heroin or that Oxycontin just solved all my troubles. And um, that feeling, that liking of that feeling can be very reinforcing. And so part of uh, the story of drug dependence, the story of addiction involves biological factors, including this reward pathway, which we've talked about a lot before, but also a, par a portion of this pathway that involves uh, opioid receptors and an intense feeling of satisfaction or, or liking that accompanies certain types of behaviors. Now this is relevant for discussion here because some of the treatments for addictions, particularly addictions to opiates and alcohol, involve uh, drugs which are antagonists of these receptors. So drugs which are antagonists um, or medications which are antagonists block receptors. They, uh, they um, fit within a particular receptor, in this case the mu opioid receptors, and they block uh, the endogenous opioids and the, um, the exogenous opioids, the opioids in, in the drug that you're taking, in the heroin that you're taking, from activating the, re that receptor. It kind of blocks that drug activation, which decreases the pleasure associated with use uh, of drugs. So if you are taking, uh, for instance, naltrexone as a medication and you use heroin, it won't be very satisfying for you. Or if you use Oxycontin, it won't be very satisfying for you because the naltrexone is antagonizing that receptor system. It's blocking activity within that receptor system. Um, with less pleasure from using the drug, you're less likely to use the drug. Um, so, uh, you know, these uh, type of opioid antagonists can be useful for managing recovery uh, for opiates and interestingly also for alcohol. Um, they can also actually be helpful for emergency treatment. So if someone is in a state of uh, overdose and for instance maybe their breathing has stopped because they've had such a high dose of heroin or a high dose of Oxycontin that their brainstem is no longer uh, activated or activated and signaling proper breathing, you can give someone intravenous opioid antagonists to block the effects of the drug and kind of get them breathing again uh, quickly which can be in an emergency very helpful, but those same drugs can be used on a more kind of protracted basis for managing uh, treatment and recovery. So that's an example of a biological factor and the implications that that biological factor has for treatment. So moving on, when we think about psychological factors in our biopsychosocial factor uh, uh, model, um, one of the things we've talked about a lot, or I've talked about a lot, are 
the different cues associated with drug use. So, you know, for any drug that we've talked about, if you're using the drug repeatedly, things in your environment which accompany the use of that drug can become conditioned over time through classical conditioning to stand in or represent for that drug. And in doing so can inspire craving. So if you um, always you know, use heroin by dissolving it in water and then cooking it up on a spoon with a cigarette lighter later on in your life, even though you're not perhaps consciously aware of it, if you see a cigarette lighter, it starts to trigger within you a feeling of craving because that cigarette lighter, which obviously has many other purposes, has become in your mind associated with using heroin. And there are countless other examples we could make um, uh, about different drugs uh, for, you know, for this type of effect. So one psychological factor are cued associations that accompany use. Another psychological factor that I've talked a little bit about are just all the different beliefs and expectations that we hold consciously about uh, how drug use will change our emotions and our behavior. So if you've used you know, drugs for a long uh, period of time, you may see your drugs as a way of feeling good or rewarding yourself, or you may see your drugs as a way of coping with stress, or you may see your drugs as a way of socializing with other people. And this could be true of almost any drug, whether it's caffeine or alcohol or nicotine. You know, if you use uh, opiates for a long period of time, they become, in your mind, a way of you know, dealing with life's problems or a way of celebrating life's successes or anything else like that. These are beliefs that you hold uh, in your mind kind of consciously about your drug use. So the implications here of our awareness or our understanding of these psychological factors in addiction are that we can plan psychotherapies or we can develop psychotherapies that help to address these psychological factors. So in psychotherapy, we can work on helping people to recognize the cues that trigger their craving, things which maybe they're not consciously aware of, but have been associated with drug use and now you know, trigger craving and make it difficult to avoid using. We can help people to recognize those cues, those triggers, and either uh, avoid them if possible or deal with them in some more constructive way if, if necessary. Um, you know, some cues you could avoid, you know, for instance, if you always use drugs with a particular group of people, you might simply learn to avoid socializing with those people. Uh, other cues are tricky. If, if you always use drugs when you're stressed out, it's difficult to imagine avoiding stress in your life. That's probably impossible, but you might in psychotherapy learn to manage stress another way so as to not let it get to such a level in your life as to trigger a craving for drug use. Another thing we can do in psychotherapy is challenge people's beliefs and expectations about drug use and help them to develop new and different and more healthy and less drug use promoting types of beliefs. Um, now, th there's a lot of complexity that goes into psychotherapy. I don't mean to overly simplify it, but I just want to illustrate here an example of how our awareness of the psychological factors that go into drug use can help inform how we treat drug dependence. You know, planning psychotherapies which address some of the factors, some of the variables which seem to play a role in maintaining drug use. Moving on, if we talk about social factors, and I've, I've addressed this a little bit in previous uh, lectures, but it's worth repeating. Um, peer groups are, uh, you know, an important or play an important role in our drug use or our not using of drugs. You know, the people you hang out with, your friends and your family, um, tend to influence your behavior, whether you realize it or they realize it or not. Um, you know, if you have a peer group that uses drugs, then at the very least, they help you get access to drugs. It's easier to use drugs if your friends have them and can share them with you. Also, their behavior sets up norms or standards which you tend to conform to, even if you don't exactly recognize it on a conscious level. If your friends are all heavy drinkers, it's likely that you'll drink more heavily over time. If your friends all smoke cigarettes, it's easier for you to pick up the habit of smoking cigarettes. If your friends all use opiates together, or if you've become friends because you associate when you all use opiates, the peer group provides access to drugs and support and kind of encouragement for drug use, even if you or the members of that group don't really consciously recognize that. So with that in mind, you know, recognizing the role that that factor plays in drug uh, use and maintaining drug use, we can encourage people who are trying to recover from drug use to seek other forms of social support. So many types of treatment emphasize meeting with groups, 
either as a part of formal treatment or um, privately, like in Alcoholics Anonymous groups or Narcotics Anonymous groups, groups of people who get together around a shared goal of not using drugs. Essentially, this provides another peer group for folks who are trying to uh, seek treatment and recovery from drug dependence. Uh, it provides a peer group for them, a peer group which won't encourage drug use the way perhaps some of their other peer groups are or at least have been in their life. So again, biopsychosocial model, it's a way of representing a complex phenomenon that is drug use and drug dependence, and also a way of helping inform how we think about treating drug use and drug dependence. Different factors contribute to use, biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. I've just tried to highlight a couple of them in the last few slides. Ideally, what we would like to do is plan a type of treatment, an integrated treatment that addressed all that addresses all or most of these factors. That's not always possible, but ideally what we'd like to do is provide for someone uh, medications that help address the various biological factors that may be influencing their drug use, you know, therapy, psychotherapy that is, that addresses some of the psychological factors, and social support that addresses some of the social factors. If we do all that, then hopefully, hopefully, we've got a treatment program that's going to have the best chance of helping someone stop using drugs and maintain uh, abstinence, or maintain, perhaps in some cases, controlled use of a drug. Okay, so that's bio biopsychosocial model. Uh, I want to transition now and briefly talk about detoxification or detox. I've mentioned this before in lectures about alcohol. I think I even mentioned this in previous lectures about the opiates, but I want to briefly return to it and talk about what detox is. Detox is basically controlled drug withdrawal. Uh, we know that when people stop using drugs, at least stop using most of the drugs we've talked about in this class, not all of them, but most of them, they'll go through a withdrawal period. That withdrawal period is characterized by a syndrome, a collection of symptoms, which are opposite in a dark kind of way from the active uh, effects of the drug. And because most drugs make you feel good, most withdrawal symptom, uh, syndromes make you feel bad. And that's a problem because uh, those negative feelings can either be dangerous uh, to your health, or at the very least, they can encourage you to go back to using drugs. So one thing we do in detox is in some cases, we try to ensure safety. Um, the withdrawal from some drugs is dangerous. So the best example here is alcohol. If you are a heavy alcohol user, especially for long periods of time, and you stop using alcohol, you can suffer from seizures, uh, a condition called deliria tremens, which is um, kind of a, a, a dementing condition where you get in extremely confused. Um, this can actually be lethal. You can die from it, although um, it's, you know, you have to be a fairly heavy drinker for, and have been drinking for a long period of time. And, and in those cases, what we might want to do is to help ensure someone's safety by treating them with sedatives like benzodiazepines, managing some of their psychotic symptoms by giving them antipsychotic medications, also helping combat dehydration and electrolyte loss by giving them maybe intravenous water and vitamins. Um, that's a severe case. That's alcohol uh, withdrawal, which which can, for some people, be literally life-threatening. Uh, that's not true for opiates. Opiates, uh, as bad as they may seem in movies and TV shows, withdrawing from opiates typically is not particularly dangerous to the person's body. It is, however, unpleasant. So when you withdraw from using opiates, you have all sorts of really unpleasant symptoms like sweating and aching and vomiting and diarrhea and spontaneous ejaculation and just every, you know, your body hurts and you can't sleep and it's, it's really unpleasant. Not life-threatening, but really unpleasant. So one thing we can do for folks who are in this horrible state is help reduce these withdrawal symptoms, make the overall syndrome of withdrawal more manageable so there's less negative reinforcement for going back to drug use, less negative reinforcement for, for relapsing into drug use. And actually, in the next few slides, I'll talk about some of these drugs like methadone and buprenorphine that are useful for managing withdrawal. Okay, so with all that in mind, let's just finish up this little mini supplemental lecture by talking about some of the treatment options for uh, opiate uh, dependence. Well, 
as we've discussed for uh, the other drugs that in this class, there are different forms of counseling or psychotherapy which can be helpful for um, encouraging people to cut down their drug use or even quit their drug use, helping them to manage relapse uh, if and when it happens, you know, getting ready uh, for the possibility of relapsing into uh, drug use again, which happens typically for folks who are trying to quit or cut down. Um, there are different forms of therapy, uh, you know, probably don't have a lot of time to talk about all of them, but keep in mind that most of them in some way or another are trying to address some of those psychological factors in our biopsychosocial model. In terms of pharmacological options for treatments, these are medications which are designed to address some of those biological factors that, that uh, are involved in drug use and drug dependence. I've mentioned before there are uh, opiate, uh, opioid receptor antagonists like uh, naloxone, for instance, is an example of, of one of them. Um, uh, naltrexone is, is essentially the same drug. It works in a very similar way. These are drugs which uh, can be used to block, they bind to opioid receptors and block them from activating, which means that the opiate drugs you're taking uh, can be, um, uh, the opiate drugs that you're taking uh, can no longer exert such a strong effect as they were having on you. Um, these can be useful for counteracting overdose. So if you were overdosing on heroin and you were left at an emergency room, you would almost certainly be injected with naloxone. Uh, they can also be useful for managing withdrawal um, and helping people to maintain abstinence in their drug use because if you take a pill form of this drug like naltrexone, over time you just have less reward from using drugs and less craving for the drugs uh, in, uh, in the first place. So they, they're useful uh, pharmacological treatment, uh, opioid receptor antagonists. Another treatment approach that we can do is we can give people a replacement drug, like for instance methadone. Methadone is a synthetic opiate uh, which, you can, which can be administered you, to you at a medical clinic, a uh, methadone clinic, and what it will do is provide a kind of a long-lasting opiate effect without that initial rush of pleasure. So if you take uh, methadone, which is typically it's in a, a liquid form that's then dissolved into like a you know, sort of like a Kool-Aid type orange juice that you, you drink, you don't get a really strong high, like a, a sense of the rush or that kind of orgasmic burst of pleasure that you might if you were injecting heroin or crushing up uh, and snorting Oxycontin maybe. But what you do get is very little withdrawal because it stops you from going into withdrawal um, from the drug that you're trying to quit using. You're substituting the methadone for the heroin or substituting the methadone for the Oxycontin. Um, so in a sense, you're still using a drug, which I think for some people may seem a little bit odd or even a little bit uh, threatening, but the difference is the methadone, if used properly, if given to you by a clinic, is a pure drug. It has no adulterants in it that are dangerous to you. It's given at a very precise dose, so you're not going to overdose. Um, it's essentially safe for you to use uh, and kind of maintain an addiction to, if you will, uh, and it helps you avoid using drugs which are more dangerous for you, drugs which you can overdose on or drugs which are contaminated by adulterants or are illegal to use and can get you in trouble that way. And methadone clinics are, can be helpful in that way. Uh, while the person's there, they, they undergo drug testing to see if they're using other drugs to make sure that they're not cheating the system. Um, so a lot of folks, uh, you know, I used to work at a clinic in New Jersey and most of our folks there who were in treatment for heroin addiction were also going um, in for methadone maintenance. They would show up every day at their methadone clinic, um, take their dose of methadone, which would put them in a slightly nar you know, sort of narcotic state, but would stop them from, from going into withdrawal so they wouldn't get that sick withdrawal feeling and wouldn't feel as motivated to go back to using heroin. A similar drug would be is uh, buprenorphine, which is a relatively, um, well, it's not really new, but it's a relatively new drug. It's another synthetic opiate. It also works like methadone to prevent withdrawal. Um, the difference here is um, buprenorphine is available in pill form and can be prescribed by a physician. So rather than having to go to a um, methadone clinic every day and get a dose measured out by a nurse or a physician's assistant, the user can just take his or her dose of buprenorphine at home, uh, which has some advantages for, for users. 
Um, there's also a form of the drug called Suboxone, which is essentially buprenorphine and naloxone combined. So it gives you a little bit of that management of the withdrawal symptoms from the buprenorphine, but it also, because it has the naloxone in it, decreases the craving for using um, the opiates as well. So it kind of hits both of those uh, biological factors, the, the kind of the craving for the drug and also the withdrawal syndrome as well. Um, I'll link to a really good video clip uh, from the HBO Addicted series that talks about treatment with buprenorphine and suboxone for a young people, or two young people in this profile who are both addicted to opiates. It's really quite good. Okay, so with that in mind, we're, we're done with our little supplemental lecture again. I, I told you it was a short one. I hope you found it kind of interesting. It got some information that I should have mentioned in my last lecture. Um, so with that in mind, next lecture, lecture series 12, is going to be marijuana, and it will be, I promise, the last lecture series for our class. So I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. And like I said last time, and like I say, I, I suppose at the end of every lecture, thanks for your attention. Take a few minutes to relax and let all this information sink in. And then when you're ready, come back because I'll be here with another lecture. Thanks, guys.